Well, you know, on, uh, on uh, this uh, Resurrection Day, Easter Day, it is sort of an odd thing for pastors because, like, everybody knows what you're going to be talking about. <laughs> and so that's always a little bit uh, tricky. But before I jump into the thoughts that uh, I wanted to share today, I wanted to also give you a heads up. Uh, starting next week, we're going to be beginning a new series that I'm titling Blink. You know, like Blink with Your Eyes. And the, the uh, subtitle is The Hope of Heaven. Uh, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus today, and among many things that we celebrate is abundant life that we're given now, eternal life that we're given a portion of now, and then eternal life that we enjoy, well, eternally. And uh, there are so many places in Scripture that talk about us being citizens of heavens, that we're to think about heaven, that we're to uh, uh, keep our focus on heaven, that we're to live for heaven, we're to be encouraged by the hope of heaven. And uh, I thought it would be appropriate, especially as we're celebrating the, the risen uh, Savior, to talk a little bit about our future home. Now listen, the scripture does not speak entirely or thoroughly to what heaven looks like and what it's about and what the priorities are in heaven. I'll give you a little sneak preview. It doesn't have anything to do with people being somehow changed into an angel, sitting on a cloud, playing a harp. <laughs> Nothing like that. But I actually think we will be discovering the joys of heaven for all eternity. People think, well, gee, wouldn't it get boring after a while? No, I don't think so. There'll always be new layers of the onion to unpeel. Every day will be a brand new day. It's going to be awesome. And again, Scripture tells us to take joy and to find hope and encouragement in the fact that this is not our home. Home is awaiting us. Our real citizenship is in heaven. So we're going to spend several weeks talking about heaven, as well as one of those weeks in the series, we're going to look at just the raw hard truth about hell as well, but the majority of it's going to be on a picture of heaven as it's presented in Scripture. Super encouraging for us. So, the reason why Easter is such a big deal to us Christians and all over the world is because the resurrection is actually the anchor of our faith. If Easter is true, if the resurrection is true, then it's game on for everything Christian. And if the resurrection is not true, well, then it's game over for everything Christian uh, because all of history hangs on this event that we refer to as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's what launched the church, what launched Christianity. Before the resurrection, there were no Christians. Uh, when Jesus was crucified, everybody thought he was going to do what deceased people do, which is to stay, not a trick question, what deceased people do is just to stay, to stay dead, very good. Even Jesus' closest friends were not expecting him to come out of the tomb. In fact, they were expecting him to stay in the tomb. Nobody was standing at the uh, rock, guarding the, uh, you know, blocking the tomb, doing a countdown on the day of his resurrection. Ten, nine, eight. Nope, nobody was there doing that. And when they looked into the empty tomb, uh, everybody was surprised because, well, I say this every Easter, that uh, nobody expected Nobody. In fact, they looked into the empty tomb. Nobody said, he's alive. Instead, they were talking about who stole the body. Now, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the majority of our New Testament, summarized it all beautifully in the passage that we're going to look at today in 1 Corinthians. And uh, it's really, I think, the highlight of all the ideas that we've been addressing in our series on Stand Firm. It was actually this verse and this passage was the inspiration for the entire series that we've been in for the last four weeks. Nothing's more important than the resurrection in terms of our confidence in the Lord Jesus. So I want to share with you what he said and then explain why and what he said, why it was so important for all of us and relevant for all of us today. Now, I wanna start at the end because, well, you have to start at the end to get where he was going with all of this. So the end of the chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 says, death has been swallowed up in victory 
Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we come to the key verse, chapter, uh, verse 58. It says, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor, uh, you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, to really appreciate what the Apostle Paul is saying here, we have to actually go all the way back to the beginning of this very long chapter. It's actually the second longest chapter in the entire New Testament. And so I want to bring you back to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, which reads, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel. We hear that term gospel all the time. He's about to tell us here what he means by that. I preach to you which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. For, I, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Verse 6, and after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. And though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And so since the resurrection is the key thing in Christianity, everything in Christianity rises or falls on this matter of the resurrection of Christ. I want to do three things today, and I want to speak to three different groups of people who are here with us this morning. First of all, I want to speak to that group of you who believe, but you wonder. I believe all of this, but I wonder, will I really be united with my loved ones someday? I wonder, is this really all true? I've staked much of my life on this. I hope it's all true. I wonder sometimes, how about you? I hope it's all true. I want it to be all true. And then there's a second group that may be here today, and those of you who wonder how anyone could believe. In other words, man, we're in the 21st century, Barry. Are you kidding me? In the, in the dawn of scientific evidence, are you believing me? Are, 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 you, are you kidding me? You actually believe that a dead guy got up from the grave because there are so many explanations that really disqualify the whole notion of a dead guy getting out of the grave. I, I, I wonder how anybody in our enlightened day and age could believe such a thing. In fact, you may be here today simply because you're with family and, uh, you know, the family sort of frowned if you didn't come and so, you know, you're polite so you're not going to be sitting there with your arms crossed. But on the inside, you've got your arms crossed. Like, man, I just, you know, when is lunch? When is this all going to be done? Listen, I hope for you to just remember remove one objection. One objection is all I hope for you that might be removed and that should there come a time where you would like to explore the claims of Christ, perhaps you could do so without surrendering intellectual integrity. And then finally, I would like to speak to a group of you who wonder if it's possible to believe again. I mean, you know, you were raised in church, you went to camp, you got the t-shirt, you said the sinner's prayer, you dedicated your life, you got baptized, you signed a card, you met with the deacon, you uh, went on a mission trip, and then you grew up, and you went to college, and you had a very smart college instructor who raised some very challenging questions, and your Sunday school Christian education could not answer those questions. And so you slipped away from faith. You lost your faith. And so I'm hoping today to give you a stepping stone back to a faith, again, that's intellectually honest and authentic. Now what's interesting in all three groups that I speak to today, those of you who believe but wonder, those of you who wonder how anyone could believe, and those of you who uh, would like to believe again but if you wonder if it's even possible. Listen, the key for all of us, whatever group you find yourself in, the key for all of us is in this passage of scripture that I just read. It shows us all the way forward. And here's why I say that. The primary argument these days against the resurrection 
has to do with the whole notion. Well, actually, I know what, before I tell you what the primary argument is, let me tell you about the arguments that I've heard over my 45 years of being a Christ follower. Really, from early on, I've always been intrigued, curious, interested what people far from God think about the things of God. And over these 45 years, it's interesting that just about all of the arguments no one really gives any credence to, people far from God, really don't even consider the arguments that they did only 45 years ago. For example, the, th the swoon theory. That was the idea that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, he got shoved into the tomb earlier than death was upon him, and then three days later he recovered, and, uh, and so you know, he didn't really rise from the dead because he was never dead. But really, skeptics have come to realize, actually, if you hung on a cross, if your feet and hands are pierced by uh, nails, if a sword has pierced your side, that the likelihood of being able to come back from that and remove that huge stone was more of a miracle, really, than him rising from the dead. So the swoon theory kind of got dismissed. And then there was all kinds of theories that came up about, okay, well, maybe it was the disciples who would steal the body to keep the movement going. But that makes no sense because Jesus really didn't speak of a movement. He was the movement. And so when he died, it really was game over. Furthermore, there's no, it makes no sense that these uh, disciples, almost all of them, would die a martyr's death. Makes no no sense that they would follow through with that over a lie, so the disciples stole the body. Nobody really believes that anymore. Or the Jewish leader stole the, bar the body. I mean, that one is just crazy from the get-go. Listen, they were trying to squash this movement. You know, the body disappearing, they were the ones who went to Pilate and said, look, we got a feeling the disciples are going to try to steal the body, so we want you to put some Roman centurions up there to make sure no one steals the body. So the idea that, you know, the Jewish leaders would be, account would, uh, be responsible for a missing body, I mean, that was just crazy from the get-go. Some will say, well, maybe it was the Roman soldiers who stole the body. And again, that makes no sense, because if you're a Roman soldier and you're given an assignment and you don't follow through on that assignment, you are risking death. The very people that were guarding that tomb might quite possibly have died for the fact that that body was missing. So it's interesting. I'm sure you guys visit websites like I do all the time where uh, atheists gather and where agnostics gather and where they share their intellectual prowess to support their non-belief. I visit those sites all the time as you do, right? And so it's interesting. There is really one argument that's left. It is the last bastion of the heart that's far from God and that is what we're going to talk about today. And so basically it's this last argument that comes up against the legitimacy of the Christian faith and the resurrection. And so the argument goes like this, the last argument that really they have, which is that the resurrection is a myth, and it is a myth because it resulted from multiple decades of what's called oral transmission. That this oral transmission of the story was exaggerated and changed over time to suit the agenda of later gen generations of Christians. Essentially, the argument suggests that people told stories, who in turn told the stories to another, and then that group of people told the story yet to another group of people. And so it just went on and on and on. And the stories of, about Jesus were never written down. That's a key component. These stories were never written down. It was all through oral transmission. And so much time has gone by that all of the eyewitnesses are now dead. And by the time it did get written down, the story of a dead guy getting out of the grave. By the time it did get written down, um, there was all kinds of things that had been made up about this and uh, all kinds of things to make Jesus something that he never claimed to be, all kinds of stories that uh, suggest Jesus was something that he was not. In other words, regarding the resurrection of Jesus, the written accounts were too far removed from actual events to be accurate accounts of actual events. That's the argument. It's the classic argument used by many, and really the only argument that's, at least in terms of people who are just passionate about not believing, it's really the only argument that you see them rallying around anymore. 45 years ago, there was a whole bunch of things that they'd rally around, but really not so much anymore today. 
It's a classic argument. They would suggest it's all just legend. It's all hearsay. So today, I want to share with you why you can have extraordinary confidence in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to put your thinking caps on a little bit. Bear with me a little bit. It's a little bit academic, but I'm telling you, I'm actually pretty pretty uh, uh, committed to the idea of making sure that my faith is grounded in evidence, making sure that, you know, that my following Jesus isn't rooted in the same stuff of why children follow Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and things like that. You know, I want to make sure this faith that I'm staking my entire life on is rooted in some kind of evidence, some kind of reason that makes sense. So, all scholars agree these days, which is rare to find scholars that would agree on anything, they agree about the Apostle Paul, that he was a real person. The Apostle Paul lived in the first century. He's not some made-up fictional character. All scholars agree that Paul had an extraordinary influence on this early church. And as you know, the Apostle Paul wrote a bunch of letters that have been collected together, and part of what we refer to as our New Testament, 13 letters as a matter of fact. What you may not have heard is that if you went to school and learned as I did, which I never bought, but nevertheless, it's a notion that's out there, that not all the letters that are in our New Testament were actually penned by Paul. Now, they have Paul's name on it, but they weren't necessarily penned by Paul. And some scholars uh, consider that there were six of those letters that the word we use for it is uh, pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha, is a, it's a literature term that claims, you know, in literature that claims to be written by a certain individual who in fact did not write it. Six of Paul's 13 letters are considered by some, not by me, but by some to be pseudepigrapha. So, what would happen in the first, second, third century is that people would write something down and then they would sign Paul's name to it. And the reason why is that, hey, if you put a famous person's name on it, it might get read. In fact, if you put a famous person's name on it, there might be a library that would actually pay you for that literature. And so there's some scholars that believe that some of Paul's letters were not actually written by Paul. However, there are seven of the 13 letters that virtually all scholars agree that they were indeed written by Paul, and they were all written in the 50s and 60s, sometimes even the 40s. All scholars agree regarding seven of the 13 that those were written, I'm not talking about the 1950s and the 1960s, I'm talking about the original 50s and 60s. Now that's important to keep in mind, first century 50s and 60s. And so we're going to call these seven of the 13 letters the undisputed letters of Paul. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon. And what I just read from you is actually one of those undisputed letters, which is 1 Corinthians. That was what I just read from you. It's undisputed. Now, 1 Corinthians was written in the year 55. And I want to put this into sort of a context for you, a timeline, if you will, give you a little history, because when all of this was written. Again, think about that oral transmission argument, got passed down from group to group over decades and decades and decades, so it just wasn't reliable. The argument is that there was no written record. And so the when it was written is actually extraordinarily important. So most scholars agree that Jesus came along in the year 32. Well, actually, he died in the year 32. This was when he was actually crucified. Nobody disputes anymore the historical Jesus. Nobody disputes anymore that, uh, you know, he uh, uh, hung on a cross, uh, a, a Roman tool of torture. So the Apostle Paul then comes along, and in the year 55, he pins this letter to the church that was at Corinth. And uh, uh, no one, you know, disputes that whatsoever. And he writes this letter after he has visited Corinth, which took place in the year 52. That's when he originally went to Corinth, visited them, established a church, came back home, and three years later, he writes them this letter to encourage them. 
And no one disputes this. It's what explains Paul's use of past tense when we were looking at this portion of scripture. I read this to you earlier. Let's look at it again just to see the past tense. Now, brothers, I wanted to remind you. In other words, it's not the first time I've shared this with you. I'm reminding you, remember? You are of the gospel which I preached, not preaching, preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. He's reminding them in this letter written in 55 of something he taught them back in 52. And he goes on, and this is really important. He says, for, I, for what I received. Now, Paul is about to tell them what somebody else told him. He's about to tell these believers in Corinth, just passing on to them what was passed on to him at some earlier point. The point is that this information that he's about to tell them again, which was, had been told to him, Paul, earlier, and it had been around for a while. So Paul's making the point, hey, I just passed this on to you three years ago what had been passed on to me, and now I'm reminding you about what I told you three years ago. Continue on to verse three. I passed on to you, uh, on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried. Now, you need to know this. No one disputes, no, no one disputes that Jesus was executed by the Romans. No one uh, disputes that Jesus was a historical person. But now we come to the point that is argued somewhat. And that is that he was raised on the third day according to to the scriptures. This is where we need to kind of apply the brakes, stop and think about this for a moment. So here we are, he writes the letter in 55, He's re he visited them originally in 52. Um, and so we're talking about here really just 20 years after the event. 20 years after the event of the resurrection. Now listen, if you're 25 years old, 20 years ago seems like a long, long time ago. But on the other hand, if you're 50 years old, 20 years ago isn't that long ago, right? Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> and the point of all this is that Paul clearly believed that Jesus rose from the dead just 20 years ago after the event. And he said someone told him about Jesus rising from the dead. Now, something else that you should know about this timeline is that when all this was taking place, this was not Paul's first trip to go establish churches. He had actually gone to plant a church in the year 44. He went to Cyprus. Cyprus is an island nation where he, uh, there on his first missionary journey, he was telling people then about Jesus rising from the dead. And remember, Paul said somebody else told him the same thing and at which point we need to ask, uh, uh, okay, so what about the rumor of the written account that didn't happen until decades and decades after the event? And all the eyewitnesses that were dead and gone, what about that argument? But the truth is you actually have a written account by Paul, not just oral transmission, acknowledging Jesus risen from the dead within 12 years now of the event. And so we go back to Corinthians. It says that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. So here we have 12 years after the crucifixion, Paul is claiming that Jesus appeared to Peter and to the 12 apostles He's saying this and writing this not 50 years ago, not 50 years after the fact, not 40 years after the event, not 30 years, but 12 years. And so here's another question. How did Paul know that Peter believed in the resurrection? How did Paul know that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I have an answer to that. <laughs> 
He tells us how he knew this, and it was found in another undisputed letter written by the Apostle Paul, and that was the letter written to the church in Galatia. Paul tells us in this letter that three years after he is converted, after the Damascus Road experience where he gets knocked down, scales fall from his eyes, and he, re- and he encounters the risen Christ, uh, that three years after his conversion, he goes to Jerusalem to pay Peter a visit. You know, when I, when I, I look at verses like we're going to look at right now from Galatians, I, I just, you know, I always try to stop and put myself in the scripture and imagine that. And I'm thinking, you know, if I had recently come to faith and I actually had a chance to go visit the people who walked with Jesus, who had actually seen him die and actually seen him rise from the dead, do you think you'd be interested in, in having an encounter like that? Oh my goodness, man, I get a few things that make me more excited than an opportunity to jump at that. So that's exactly what, what uh, Paul does and is captured here in Galatians. After three years, that is after my conversion, three years after that, I went to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter. And I stayed with him, notice the detail here. I stayed with the guy 15 days. I didn't see any of the other apostles, but I did see James, the Lord's brother. And we know that James, the Lord's brother, came to faith after the resurrection. He was not one of the original followers. And so we go back to our timeline, this meeting with Peter that took place probably around the year 40. And we know that that meeting with Peter in Jerusalem happened at 40, which was three years after Paul's conversion. So that means that Paul was probably converted in the year 37. Which means that Paul became a Christ follower only five years after the resurrection. And actually, there's pretty good research to suggest it happened much sooner than that. I actually believe it wasn't five years. I mean, that's five years max. I'm just being generous with the timeline here. I think it was actually probably half that amount of time. And so here we are, five years after the resurrection, Peter and James are in Jerusalem, and they are talking about the resurrection at this time, which is just astounding. I mean, this is the remarkable thing about this, because the gospel accounts that we usually read from on Easter Sunday, and even the book of Acts, which I give full credence to, I, you know, I have no, no problem with those Uh, books of the Bible, Uh, they're they're in my Bible, of course I uh, regard them as the word of God. But it is a point of fact that the gospel accounts, we're not actually even sure when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was written. There are some who are not even sure that John actually wrote John, if you will. And the book of Acts, we know that that was written at the very earliest in 80, most likely closer to 90 AD. And so the point is, is that Most of the gospel uh, accounts of the resurrection and the accounts of what happened in Jerusalem, the streets of Jerusalem after the resurrection, these were written many, many, many years after the event. The problem for skeptics, the problem with the whole argument about what about oral transmission, here's where the skeptics have a problem. The problem has a name. His name is Paul, because his written account did not take place decades and decades later. Paul was talking about and writing about the resurrection within just a few years of the actual event. He became a believer within a few years of the resurrection. He met with eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And as they say in TV, uh, but there's more. It gets better still. (laughs) It gets better still. Most scholars agree that the part of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians that we've read twice now was actually a part of a creed. What is a creed? A creed is a very carefully crafted Series of memorable statements, carefully crafted series of memorable statements that were, ensure, that were used to ensure accurate transmission of important information. That's what a creed is. 
And here's why. Because in the first century, very few people could read or write. If you lived in one of the larger cities, you know, probably no more than 10 or 12% of people could actually read and write. And that's in a large city. If you lived out in the country, you weren't a part of the large city, virtually nobody could read or write. And so for centuries, early Christian leaders used important truths in creedal form to help people learn. Now in our culture, we don't really use creeds very much, but there is one creed that all of us have actually been exposed to. All of us have learned by the one creed in our culture. And that creed goes like this. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y, and depending on what part of the country you lived in, Y Z or Y and Z. The creed changed a little bit by adding that little word and. So let me ask you why did we put the ABCs into that style with that cadence? It's to teach children who could not read or... Exactly. And then we added a little ending to that creed. Uh, now I know my ABC, soon I'll have my PhD. <laughs> now I know my ABCs, soon I'll have my PhD. Now I know my ABC, soon I'll have my PhD. Your turn. Now I know... Soon. See, you guys learned it. That's how creeds work. You just repeat because there's a little cadence to it. That's the one creed that we have all been exposed to. So in this letter to the Corinthians, written about 20 years after the resurrection, Paul quotes a well-known creed that already existed and that was so popular among Christians that Christians had actually already memorized this creed. And the creed actually, you know, just slight change of words from original language to English language. The creed actually works pretty well in English. It goes like this. Christ died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead and was seen. Christ died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead and was seen. Christ died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead and was seen. That's the creed that they we're looking at here that had existed for quite some time. And here's what scholars tell us, that when Paul was writing this undisputed letter to the Corinthians, and he's explaining that, hey, this is the gospel, people. This is the most important thing. He included a part of a creed that was very well known and that people already knew. And the importance of this is that the resurrection was already so widely accepted that it had been summarized and included in a creed for the church. And this, by the way, this creed found in the first few chapters of 1 Corinthians 15 is probably the oldest piece of literature in the entire New Testament. It predates all of Paul's letters because Paul knew it before he even included it in the letter. He was intentional about including the creed in his letter. Now, does all of this prove that Jesus is who he claimed to be? Nope, it does not. Does this prove that Jesus rose from the dead? Mm -mm, absolutely not, does not prove that. But here's what I don't want you to miss from all of this. That Paul's letter is evidence that people in Jerusalem who saw Jesus die believed he rose from the dead. You cannot get around this. His letter is compelling evidence that when he wrote to the church of Corinth, there were already people living in Jerusalem who believed Jesus rose from the dead and who had witnessed Jesus die. And the, the letter of Paul, it does prove two things. Number one, 
Paul's letter proves that the resurrection of Jesus was not a product of decades of oral transmission, which I'm just wondering now, what is the atheist and agnostic community going to do now? Because I tell you what, some of this information I got was taken directly from their literature. And there's a great concern of, gee, we don't have a leg to stand on anymore. Because this was the last argument that made any sense. And because of Paul's letters, this is proven that, hey, there was written account, and it wasn't decades and decades and decades later. And so the whole corruption by oral transmission argument holds no water. The second thing that Paul's letter proves is this. It proves that belief in the resurrection was documented while eyewitnesses were still, I know how to put this, eyewitnessing. <laughs> eyewitnesses were still living, that they were still around, walking around in the streets of Jerusalem. And this is huge. I'm telling you, skeptics, the only thing left that's just sort of take a stand, a last bastion of, you know, trying to be intellectually, uh, you know, honest with themselves is, okay, well, you know, the oral transmission argument doesn't hold water anymore. I, I, you know what? Maybe Paul was just lying about it all. Maybe he was just not telling the truth for some crazy reason. But listen, There is no reasonable scholar who has ever suggested that Paul fabricated all of this. Uh Uh-uh, and I'll tell you why. It's because Paul's life validated his belief. His life validated his belief. No one disputes that Paul was an educated man, he was a connected man, he was a Pharisee. He left comfort and privilege at home when he chose to follow Christ, a career that had status, he had a role as a leader in Jerusalem, and then he takes off to do the most imaginable thing, the most dangerous thing imaginable, which is to load up on ship or foot or, or horseback and travel around the Mediterranean rim, establishing churches where he was nearly killed numerous times in those ventures. And to make matters even more crazy is that his message included speaking to Gentiles, which is all of us, that we as non-Jewish people were now included in the family of God because Jesus rose from the dead. And God's family is now the entire earth and not just one nation. We will never, ever fully appreciate on our days on earth of just how uh, dangerous that message was and how outrageous that message was. What an offense that was to the Jewish community. We will never fully comprehend, fully understand, never really fully appreciate what Paul did. I mean, the guy was beaten, he was thrown in prisons, wherever he went, riots started all over the offense of Gentiles becoming a part of God's family. So, what's the point of sharing all of this? That our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is founded on evidence and not blind faith. Now, is there ever points where we step out in faith? Sure, there are plenty of things, but at the core of our faith is actual evidence why this makes sense. And regarding the things that do require some faith, maybe even some blind faith, I mean, in my 45 years of following Jesus, you know, I've taken plenty of steps that felt like stepping over a cliff, uh, hoping that God would be there to hold me up. How about y'all? I've taken steps like that. You know, sometimes he leads us into that. But here's another point of sharing all of this, is that the resurrection of Jesus is what gives credibility to everything else Jesus said. You know, the way we say it around here frequently is, listen, if a man can predict his own death, how he will die, and then he will rise from the dead three days later, if a man can predict all of that and then pull it off, well, I'm just going with everything else he had to say. Gives credibility to everything else that he had to say. 
I guess I have to close with the same words that the Apostle Paul did. Therefore, in light of all this, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So, by way of quick application, to those of you who believe but wonder, I want you to know that your faith is not in vain, that you can stake your life on this gospel. It's okay to wonder. It's not okay to wander. It's okay to wonder, not okay to wander. (laughs) To those of you who wonder how anyone could believe, if that's you today, now you know. That's, this is how we believe. We, we, we have evidence for this. It's not made up because of uh, you know, corruption through oral transmission. And I hope that this will be a, a bridge to you. That if the Lord taps on your shoulder like he did to me years ago and says, Hey, I love you. You were created to do your life in, through, and around me. You were never meant to sit in the pilot seat. You were meant to walk with me and be yielded and submitted to my lordship. And if you would take me up on that, I would show you true life, abundant life, life eternal. Perhaps the Holy Spirit will tap on your shoulder. And now you'll know. You can do this knowing that there's evidence behind such a decision. And maybe you're in that third group here of wonder if it's possible to believe again. If you're here today and you've wandered and you want to come back to God, maybe you tried to deal with your adult issue utilizing a Sunday school education. To you, I would say, maybe there are answers to your questions. Answers that you just have not yet embraced whatever group you're in you should know this that there is no better day to come to the risen savior than this day he welcomes you there's no better day than today to acknowledge the name that is above every other name Jesus the one who died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead and was seen. Would you stand and close in prayer? Father, I want to pray for the one here that I know you're speaking to hearts. I pray for the one who's hearing your voice say, come to me. I pray that your grace would be upon them so that they could respond to your invitation that they would welcome you into their heart that your grace to yield to bow the knee to your lordship you your grace would be upon them to just say yes and if that's you i mean that's a decision i made 45 years ago when the gospel was presented to me my thought was if this is true if this is all true I will dedicate my entire life to this. And the Lord wants you to know it's all true. (laughs) And this is a good day to dedicate your life to him and to his purpose, to become acquainted with him, to become a follower of Christ. You say, well, I don't know if I can do it. Let me tell you up front. No, you can't do it. But with God's help, God's spirit, God's power and strength, little by little, we follow and we get better at doing it. I'm going to say amen to that. Little by little, we get better at it. Jesus, before we close, I just want to say before you and before your family here that I am truly grateful that you had me on your mind and heart when you died on that cross as you did each one in this room. I just feel like somebody needs to hear that too, that Jesus hung on the cross 
we tend to think of that as something that was done for all of the world and all of humanity. And while that's a true statement, it's also true that it was personal. He was thinking of you. Your face was on his heart. Your face was on his mind. He was whispering your name under his breath while he was hanging on that cross. So Jesus, I just want to say thank you for that. And this day, Lord, I return to you to one more time say, be my Lord. Thanks for being my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I want to be the man you created me to be. And so I take your hand today. I say yes to following you. Because you're the victor over death and the grave. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. Hey, if you uh, were doing a little business with God there, and you know it's your day to get right with Him and to begin following Him, before you leave, I'd like you to join me or my prayer team that are up here and just say that to somebody. Hey, God met me today. I'm choosing to follow Him. Before you leave, I'd like my prayer team to join me up front here. Let us pray for you. Otherwise, hey, the wonderful, you guys have a wonderful afternoon. Resurrection blessings to you. Come back next week as we start this new series, Blink, The Hope of Heaven. The Lord bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>